Ever since its debut in 2015, Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain has continued to shock and enthrall a polarized audience. In discussing the final true Metal Gear Solid title during development, director Hideo Kojima often mused how difficult it proved providing a satisfying finale, a missing link to unify the series as one. One thing from Alpha to Omega, despite its considerably sized audience already knowing in effect how that story would end. In this electronic virtual essay, after a long absence, kept you waiting, huh? Join me, Jorn Lee of Futura Sound Productions, as I offer up a theory to explain the Phantom Pain's unique, often open-ended structure, one never before considered that's taken seven long years merely to grasp and formulate. Let's go. It was only by conceptualizing Kojima's task writing MGSV in visual terms that I realized how difficult it must have proven to be, and in addition, the amazing creative opportunity that his approach afforded. Simply put, writing this game on many levels resembles something like a Rubik's Cube. We'll see how Kojima exploits this unique structure to fill in gaps from previous MGS titles set as they are in the, the future from the Phantom Pain's in-game setting year of 1984, and also how, in turn, the almost wormhole quality this imposes, Kojima utilizes to enact themes from the game's arguable central influence beyond Herman Melville's Moby Dick, George Orwell's novel 1984. Uh, but for now, let's just get this basic Rubik's Cube idea straight while keeping in mind the party slogans from that novel. In particular, the one about controlling the past. Anything that happens in MGS5, even before a word or line of its code gets written, has to, by definition, come to bear on the other games. And this seems at first like a paradox. Either too much will be changed about the other games, harming their original story and even maybe themes, or too little will have an impact, rendering MGS5 itself near completely pointless. Like a Rubik's Cube, to make anything happen within MGS5 will, like Phantom Limbs, phantasmically change, alter, or affect the content, not just context, but content of the entire series, in particular what I'll have to call the in-game future. The events taking place in Metal Gear 1 and 2, Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2, and Metal Gear Solid 4. The ones that take place after the events in the in-game chronology of The Phantom Pain. Before this gets needlessly complicated, let's stick to the Rubik's Cube, right? How does the Rubik's Cube work? Well, every step or operation that you take has, in part, a kind of roughly net algorithmic effect on the possibilities for the whole. So that means that if you went back in time and changed a single step along the way, a cascade of changes would be contained by necessity in this step to affect the entire process. Another more complex metaphor might be what's known as ontogenesis. And not only did they exist, they had already been brought back to life in the modern age. An ancient human cadaver, host to the parasites of the time. Cypher excavated such a cadaver from a permafrost region and isolated the DNA coding of the vocal cord parasites. Naturally, they were long dead and could not be brought back. But there was an alternate vessel they could use. A relative species of the Pentastomida discovered in China. It had adapted to live in the nasal cavity of animal hosts. But its genetic sequence showed signs of common ancestry with the vocal cord parasites. Ontogenesis, the path of an organism to maturity, is like a roadmap of the phylogenetic evolution of the entire strain. In Code Talker's words, 
in a tape that we receive in the actual game, The Phantom Pain. Ontogenesis is defined as the path of an organism to maturity. In the case of microorganisms, the roadmap of the evolution of an entire strain. It is by using such roadmaps that so-called evo-devo biologists, something that's brought up in the next game that Kojima would make, Death Stranding, can in effect reverse engineer formerly extinct organisms back to life, Jurassic Park style, or branch their path of maturity off into new areas and dimensions, something that we see firsthand in the actual plot of The Phantom Pain. This is the way that the vocal cord parasites that are so prominent in the game are brought back to life and weaponized. Uh, the game depicts an age where nothing makes as much common sense as it once did, to paraphrase an offhand comment made by Commander Miller, where apparent paradoxes like changing the future of the past can not only occur, but occur with medical grade precision, where entire family trees of both beings, but also evidently storylines and series, can be retroactively altered to generate almost whole cloth, entirely new maps, new forms of the past, and alternative futures redrafted by and in the present. This will get overly complicated fast, though, unless we stick to, let's say, a single subject for now of this kind of scrutiny, the character Skullface and his weapon, the Holanthropus. Cypher will rewrite the records. And I will vanish from human memory. But the thirst for revenge that I have planted will infest the system! No one can stop it now! Sahalanthus will unleash that thirst unto the future! I'm burning up! The Metal Gear Saga charts the rise and fall of the Illuminati-like group who rule the world, known roughly as the Patriots, or Cypher, and in particular how their downfall gets brought about by their own dark creations. Ones like the walking tank class of bipedal doomsday mega WMDs Metal Gears, not to mention their creation known alternatively as Snake and or Big Boss, super soldiers who father a whole generation of mercenaries and cutthroat killing machines. Now, this all has to do with the delicate balance of power during ages like the Cold War, or the present one in the early 21st century, with its own share of immense mechanized, destructive forces. But on a story level, the Phantom Pain puts into place a domino that alters the face and color of all the dominoes to come in the game world's future and our world's past. With me? That domino is the domino mask-wearing man without a face, Skull Face. Where's the other? <laughs> Very close to you. Meryl, the engineer's okay. That's a relief. I want you to look after him. Where are you now? Very close. There she is! Over there! <gasps> oh no! Damn, they've spotted me! <laughs> Meryl, what happened? In effect, Though his plot is defeated along with his own demise, Skullface tells us himself his will will live on, a seed of venomous poison implanted in the system that we wait to see blossom for years to come, slash years before. <laughs> Skullface, you see, creates the very first bipedal upright walking Metal Gears, from the Walker Gears to the big boss itself, Sahalanthropus.
This is how Skullface wanted things to play out. The Soviet Union secretly develops a new type of nuclear weapon and successfully deploys it in Afghanistan. Revealing the existence of Sahelanthropus results in a return to the glory days of the Cold War. The threat it poses reignites the nuclear arms race between the world's major powers. The demand for nuclear weapons increases around the globe. What if you then introduced a nuclear weapon anyone could get their hands on? Non-nuclear nations, militant groups of all shapes and sizes, they'd all jump at the chance. Soholanthropus was a marketing tool to sell nukes all around the world. But I think it's safe to say that plan was stamped out before it got up and running. The world's intelligence agencies never did turn up anything conclusive on it. After all, Sahelanthropus vanished before word could spread. Everything that's happened is already a fading memory, never to join the pages of history. Except for Cypher. Cypher won't forget. They'll already be working on something quietly beneath the surface. They'll use the pieces of data scraped together from this incident to build their own bipedal weapon. It'll take them a long time to complete it, but for now, the greed sector have found their new life's work. We'll have to be ready too. Having glimpsed the possibilities of such death machines, we're told the system is sure to evolve in a new direction, or old direction, as it were. It is also uh, this lust for power and supremacy that Skullface's death enshrines that will someday drive both the Patriot system, despite its own best efforts, and its enemies to create and fight over future slash past creations like Metal Gear Rex and Ray, and in turn fuel the dreamy lust for revenge to possess enemies of that system like Liquid or Solidus Snake. The conflict within the system's body will ultimately bring it to its own death, like a body torn apart by pathogens and parasites. Ultimately, The Phantom Pain is a story of debasement and corruption, of decay and poison, of venomous bait. What better kind? Skullface becomes as a result a sort of ghost who will, it seems, slash seemed, haunt the entire saga in something that will define soon as ex post facto style, no less phantasmically than the ghosts that we already knew were haunting the saga of Frank Yeager or the boss. Maybe the cleanest visual way to convey this is simply through Liquid Snake's tattoo, a modified Rod of Asclepius. And apologies for the pronunciation. In the wake of MGS5's Rubik's Cube reshuffling, this symbol, synonymous as it is with medicine and doctors going all the way back to ancient Greece, becomes, ex post facto, a nod to the big boss that he encountered as a kid, the former medic, Venom Snake. Even the heads of your fellow diamond dogs resemble ex post facto, following Venom Snake's hallucination of Skullface's ghostly, shriveled, purpling head, copies of Skullface, carriers of his same awful disease. Like we will slash already have done in MGS1, we have served in this game it seems as the vectors, yet again for a terrible word-based parasite or pathogen, except instead of fox dye, it's more like Skullface's sick point of view in general the seed that he's bred inside the system. Speaking of antiquity, let's define that phrase, ex post facto. It's derived from medieval Latin, and it can roughly translate to, in the light of subsequent events. It's the strange dynamic offered between the in-game and outside game layers of future and past that provide MGS in general and MGS5 in particular with a unique spin or kind of ex post facto, which, if I were feeling cheeky, I might shorthand as ex po f. To see this more clearly, consider something I've mentioned on this channel before, how the imposition of Skullface as a character in all of his recognizable demarcators, ex post facto alters our understanding of the classic Metal Gear Solid character Revolver Ocelot. In the wake of the Phantom Pain, it becomes crystal clear that, as first hinted by Ground Zeroes, the wily Ocelot has evidently channeled the ghost 
or essence of a different character all along, well before his ruse of liquid ocelot. This phantom evoked by ocelot all along has been that of none other than Skullface, who were shown in the Phantom Pain and Ground Zeroes was the original thorn in the system's side. He may not have been the original cowboy lover, but he certainly shops at the same Westernware store as Ocelot. Skullface secretly conveys how Ocelot will go from the mysterious crypto sadist in the Phantom Pain to the rather theatrical, scenery chewing gigavillain that we'll encounter in the future, the future, as it were, of the past. And Ocelot, in order to fool the system, used nanomachines and psychotherapy to transplant Liquid's personality onto his own. He used hypnotic suggestion to turn himself into Liquid's mental doppelganger. For all our advances in nanotechnology, information and genetic control, they've never managed to control people at will, let alone turn one person totally into another. Of course, what all this ex post facto stuff also illustrates, as I already sort of intimated, is the slogan from Orwell's legendary dystopia 1984. Namely, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. Even this formulation resembles the Rubik's Cube algorithmic logic that I introduced us with. Get from A to C, you have to go through B, you see? But what's really key about this is the slogan's underlying point. Uh, it's the point of the whole novel, really. It's the point that its main character, Winston Smith, has to live through his worst nightmares to be uh, re-educated. As the Inquisitor O'Brien tells Winston near the novel's awful climax, and as the disappearance of the character Skullface from the official sequence of Metal Gear events also portrays, human memory, though ostensibly of a presumed, remembered, real past, in reality only exists in the form that it exists in, so long as there are presently living minds who presently remember it that way. And memories may fade, but they always serve a purpose for the living present. This is the essence of what MGS has all along called simply information control. Something that we could categorize also that word ontogenesis as a form of when you think about it. If genes are also information, which they are. After all, William Friedman, the one who would go on to break the Japanese cipher, he began his career as a geneticist before becoming a cryptographer. I'll close out by quoting O'Brien in The Ministry of Love in the novel in fuller detail. Quote, Only the disciplined mind can see reality, Winston. You believe that reality is something objective, external, existing in its own right. You also believe that the nature of reality is self-evident. When you delude yourself into thinking that you see something, you assume that everyone else sees the same thing as you. But I tell you, Winston, that reality is not external. Reality exists in the human mind and nowhere else. Not in the individual mind, which can make mistakes and in any case soon perishes, only in the mind of the party, which is collective and immortal. Whatever the party holds to be the truth is truth. It is impossible to see reality except by looking through the eyes of the party." End quote. Not yet. It's not over yet. It's with this final line in the cutscene only mission, Kingdom of the Flies, MGS5 attaches ex post facto a new meaning to what MGS2, released as it was just after and written well before the events of September 2001, then innocently had called the Manhattan Incident. Now you see it has the meaning not only of referring to the events of Metal Gear Solid 2, but also the real-world events of 2001. But just what exactly Liquid Snake or any other character from MGS had to do with that particularly infamous incident in the game's universe, well, that's been lost. Like the very existence of Skullface, Venom Snake, and Sahelanthropus, 
the history. It should be said, however, that in the words of Skullface himself from Ground Zeroes, the game that began this whole odyssey, the final moment is yours. In the truest sense of the word revolutionary, the final steps to your particular Rubik's Cube account of events are merely any of the ones made possible by the final quote-unquote unfinished configuration left open to you as a blank space that will never be completely filled by the true big boss himself, Hideo Kojima. This, in turn, closes the wormhole, as it were, by echoing ex post facto. Kojima himself was actually given the skeleton of aspects of what would become that game by an entirely different team. We're just picking up, in other words, where the real boss started slash ended as his own Alpha and Omega, as the only real future for this series. That's right, the fans, you and me. Well, thanks for watching, everyone. I'm back for good this time, as much as I can be. You can expect much more regular dispatches from Futura Sound Productions going forward. Until next time, boss. <laughs> <laughs>